look about what's new in diabetes and obesity uh, for a few minutes. And Dr. DePetty let me go first. That was very dangerous. <laughs> Okay, well, you know, as, as the American Heart Association keeps telling us, most of the cardiovascular deaths, <laughs> the responsibility for most of the cardiovascular deaths in people about age 34 to 56 is our food plan. I don't know why they never say that. Unfortunately, 34% of the population in the United States has prediabetes. Isn't that a frightening? This is the CDC data from 2017. 34% of us have prediabetes. So they are asking us to look around our practice and identify the people that have risk factors. And the one, the biggest risk factor is metabolic syndrome. I have to tell you that, again, 34% of the overall population and 50% of the people over 50 in the United States have metabolic syndrome. And ACE says that's prediabetes to begin with. So you remember what that is, it's hypertension, it's a low HDL, high triglycerides, elevated fasting glucose, and most important and common, upper abdominal obesity. So if you see that in your office, those people are at very high risk for developing diabetes over the next three years. If they're just obese, they still have a significant probability of developing diabetes. And I have to tell you, 34% of us this year are obese, and 70% of us are overweight. Ooh, another frightening statistic, particularly in our children. I know children were yesterday, but, but be sure you look around at your adolescent population, because if you are obese as an adolescent, you're going to be obese as an adult. You have about an 85% chance of carrying your obesity through life. Also, of course, there are hereditary defects, this hereditary insulin resistance, and so this, those people have a positive family history. So I told you the joke last year about Texas. In Texas, we don't say, does anyone in your family have diabetes? We say, is there anybody in your family that doesn't have diabetes? Because it's so prevalent. It's 25% of the adults in lower and southern Texas have type 2 diabetes. So again, very prevalent. Look for those people, look for them early because if we counsel them about lifestyle, if we screen them, we can actually prevent diabetes. So we ought to get on with it. How to screen? The ADA says an A1C. Remember 6.5% A1C is diabetes. Prediabetes is 5.7 to 6.4. And that's a laboratory result, not a point of care finger stick at your um, area because the, there are too many contaminants in those point of care finger sticks. You need a real venous sample. Doesn't have to be fasting, can be any time, and that's the joy of this. Remember, if it's above 5.7, the patient has a 40% chance of developing diabetes over the next three years. And if it's above, if your fasting sugar is above 110, you have about a 40% chance of developing diabetes over the next three years. So be very careful of those people. You need to counsel them. They need to be exercising. We talked about exercise today. And they need to be eating a reasonable food plan. OK. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, hemoglobin A1C because the ADA says that's really good. It, it costs a little more in some systems. But now it costs, remember, it costs your system about $2. That's about what a, a glucose costs your system. So it's much less costly than the uh, two-hour oral glucose tolerance test. And you say, wait, wait, I'm missing some people. Well, not many people. And there was a, a really nice article uh, in Obstetrics and Gynecology that came out July the 1st saying that now we ought to think about using A1C to look at postpartum patients to see if they are at risk for diabetes or if they have diabetes. Because about only 35% of the folks postpartum in the United States are actually tested for mm. diabetes. They all should be, but you know, they don't come, they're not fasting, and so on and so forth. And the, the glucose tolerance test is, you know, takes a while. So they're suggesting that they change the thought about this and that people in, in OB think about using hemoglobin A1C postpartum. And their data is really very good. If anyone wants this article, as I said, it just came out, but uh, you can email me and I'll be happy to send it along. The other place to use it in your practice is at the first prenatal visit. Now, of course, you're not looking at gestational diabetes here. What you're looking for is overt diabetes. 
type 2 diabetes that people have and they didn't know about it. And particularly in our area where the prevalence of diabetes is so high, we screen people at the first prenatal visit. And hopefully that's not at 24 weeks. Sometimes it is. But, you know, so this is not gestational we're looking for. This is you already have diabetes and I don't know it. So those people are at very high risk. So please use your A1C liberally. It appears to be quite accurate in the OBGYN practice. Okay, what are the ADA treatment goals? Well, uh-oh, they've gone up. So now your fasting sugar can be up to 130, and we're happy, and your post-meal sugar can be up to 179, because the ADA has relaxed their guidelines a little bit due to the people who have cardiovascular disease. Remember that a lot of your type 2 diabetics, even the younger ones, even the ones in the childbearing years, can have cardiovascular disease. The other thing they've done is said that a hemoglobin A1C of less than seven is the goal if you can achieve it without hypoglycemia. If you're going to cause hypoglycemia, that's significant. You ought to raise your goal. And the uh, internal medicine folks just said a few weeks ago that seven and a half was their goal. And the ADA just said, oh, I practically had a heart attack. But remember that they've been saying for years that if your patient has comorbidities, if they have coronary artery disease, then most of your childbearing age people should have an A1C of less than seven. Let's be reasonable <laughs> about that. We can do it. But as they get older, you and they are going to look at their A1C. Blood pressure, oh, I hesitate to even mention that word with Dr. DePetty in the audience. But I have to tell you that the ADA, although they said you should start to treat at 140 over 90, never believed it. And they've always thought that a blood pressure of less than 130 over less than 80 in a patient with diabetes is the way to go. So every year they've gotten a little more aggressive. So last year they said, if your patient has a high risk of cardiovascular disease, less than 130 over less than 80 is where you should be. And this year they said, well, anybody who isn't gonna have side effects by treating them to less than 130 over less than 80. So that's most people, and that's their thought. And the um, guidelines for dyslipidemia, again, I don't want to encroach upon his territory, but the ADA is very simple. If you have known cardiovascular disease, you're on a high dose statin, everybody else over the age of 40 is a moderate dose statin unless they have risk factors, then it's a high dose statin. So you say, well, who the heck with diabetes isn't on a statin? Who shouldn't be on a statin? Well, if your age is 40 or less and you have no other risk factors, that's about one person out of a thousand in my practice and probably in yours too, then you don't need to be on a statin. Okay, so renal disease, again, a couple of new things. You can use metformin, the maximum dose, down to stage, uh, an estimated GFR of 45, which is stage three, down to stage three B, so in your stage three A, kidney disease people, and you can use metformin 1,000 milligrams all the way to stage four, so an estimated GFR of 30. So when you get into stage four, you need to stop the metformin, but before that, you can continue on. So no matter what you're using it for, using it for PCOS and somebody who has glomerulonephritis, again, you can still use it, have to watch the estimated GFR. This year, they recommend bariatric surgery. They used to say, consider. This year they said, hey, you know these people who have a BMI of 40, uh, then you ought to just operate on those people if you can't control them. That's a great strategy. And they're saying, consider, consider if the BMI is 30. That's obesity. That's just over the edge of obesity. And Asians, you remember, are more likely to get diabetes at a lower BMI. So they have an even lower BMI recommendation for them. So they're saying if you can't do it with lifestyle and pharmacologic therapy, and these people are obese, think about bariatric surgery. You say, whoa, that's really amazingly uh, dynamic of them. Well, that's because, look at this data. Eight years after their bariatric surgery, 83% of the patients with preoperative type 2 diabetes had normal plasma glucose. Can you say that about any of your patients that you're treating with meds? You say that about most of your patients you're treating with insulin? No, so they have really good outcomes here. And the most recent one in JAMA in 2018 said, hey, you know, we manage these people with bypass. Look at that. They have a 22% 
completion rate and weight loss versus 10% on five-year follow-up. 55% of the bypass group and only 14% of the non-bypass group had good control of their diabetes. Oh, well, <laughs> okay. Remission, 70% of the people with bypass at five years. So very good control of diabetes, remission of diabetes with a gastric bypass if people follow the directions, okay? Okay, so what are the goals in your patients with diabetes? Well, the ACE goals, I think, are the most realistic ones. They say, yeah, we want to control the blood sugar. Obviously, that prevents the microvascular complications, the nephropathy, the neuropathy, the retinopathy. We want to avoid hypoglycemia. We really don't want these people, particularly with type 2 diabetes, to gain weight. They already have enough weight. And we want them to be reasonably satisfied. So metformin is still our favorite drug. It's still a favorite first-line drug. It has the most sustainability, and it has the fewest side effects. So what is our second-line drug? This year, for the first time, the ADA has said there is a second-line set of drugs. ACE has been saying it for years. It's the GLP-1 receptor agonist. And why did they say that? Because Victoza and now also semi-glutide which is uh, lixenotide, have both shown a decrease in cardiovascular events, and they have also shown a decrease in the rate of progression of renal disease. So again, these are really good drugs. They work very well. And you say, wait a minute, no one pays for them. Well, now uh, they're, you can use uh, these drugs as second line because of the ADA guidelines this year. Most insurance companies only require you to document that the patient has failed metformin. So get right in there, fill out that form. If they're on metformin or they have failed metformin, then you can use these. And the copay now is getting to be really pretty good. The key here is you've got to find the one the insurance company has made a deal with, and you can do that pretty readily if you have an electronic system. It usually, it usually comes up as the preferred product. So remember to think about these in your practice. Also, the SGLT2 inhibitors we'll talk about in a minute, but they have also been shown to decrease the risk of heart attack and also to decrease the rate of progression of renal disease. So these two big changes this year have allowed us to get these at a more reasonable price and also to fit them into your armamentarium. Okay, so again, these are the uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists and you know them as well as I do, but the newest one is a semaglutide or a Zempic. Uh, alvaglutide or Tanzium is on the way out. So if you have patients on this, you're gonna to have to change them over. It's going off the market. I think it goes off the market next week. In addition to that, remember these can actually result in significant weight loss and once again, have been shown to slow the rate of progression of kidney disease in the patient with diabetes. Now, Remember where exenatide came from? I'll bet you don't. The Gila monster saliva. I, I always went th at trivia games on cruises. Anyway, <laughs> this is the latest GLP-1 receptor agonist. It has been found in the venom pouch of the, what's that? Duck-billed platypus. So coming to a pharmacy near you anytime. <laughs> okay, just want to tell you that. This is a place where you may want to use the GLP-1 receptor agonist you may not have thought of. And this is a 56-year-old female with type 2 diabetes for 12 years, A1C of 9.1%. Ah, uh, you already have this lady on metformin. She already takes Glargine, Lantus, 90 units, and she takes Aspart or Novolog, 30 units before each meal. And she comes to your office and she says, this is it, you know, I've had it here. I'm gaining weight. I gained 20 pounds in the last six months. And it's your medicine. Is she right? In large measure, of course, if she ate less and took her insulin, she wouldn't gain so much weight. But nonetheless, short-acting insulins frequently cause weight gain, particularly since people ramp them up if they want to eat extra stuff. I ate lemon meringue pie. took two or three extra units. Well, that works for your A1C, but it also puts on extra pounds. So you may want to add a GLP-1 receptor agonist to this. And when you do, you can decrease the aspart. So you can decrease the rapid-acting insulin, you can decrease the weight gain 
In fact, in some of these patients, you can actually help them lose weight when you do this, when you use the GLP-1 receptor agonist and decrease the aspart. So I decrease it by a third when I start the low dose, and then we talk about your food plan, and we can increase it uh, the, to the higher dose of G GLP-1 receptor agonist, and sometimes cut back on the aspart to half or none if they're willing to exercise and use a better food plan. So it's a way to get off your bolus insulin that's causing you to gain weight. So just ponder that. Okay, the SGLT2 uh, receptor agonists are going, uh, receptor inhibitors rather, are an interesting set of chemicals. What they do is they, they haul back, uh, they, they stop you from hauling back the glucose from the filtrate. Remember, glucose is a small molecule. It goes into the kidney filtrate and the SGLT2 receptor hauls it all back so you won't get hypoglycemic. The problem with this is it hauls it all back when your sugar's 200 or 250, so you don't need to get it all back. So our SGLT2 inhibitors inhibit that process by about 50%. You say, okay, can I eat everything I want? How many calories do you think that saves you a day? Average 350. That's like a large cookie. Well, you know, <laughs> at least it's a little progress, isn't it? Okay, so are there adverse effects to putting all this glucose out in your urine? You bet there are. Uh, urinary tract infections are up, mycotic infections are up, and this is an inexorable diuresis. You could be a prune and you would still put out urine because of the glucose concentration in the urine. So remember that these can have significant side effects. And particularly, there are black box warnings on these for ketoacidosis and amputation of digits. So how are we going to prevent these problems? A lot of water, great deal of water, tremendous amounts of water, <laughs> okay? So again, SGLT2 inhibitors decrease the rate of progression of renal disease they decrease cardiovascular events. And pangliflozin is interesting because it actually decreases death from <coughs> congestive heart failure. A lot of patients with diabetes, about 30% of them eventually die from congestive heart failure. They had a heart attack, their cardiac status isn't good, their ejection fraction goes down, and their uh, congestive heart failure is difficult to control. But these act as gentle diuretics, and so they're very helpful. Have to remember, again, that they do double the risk for lower limb amputation in your patients who have cardiovascular disease, particularly peripheral vascular disease, probably not the best drugs for them. So if you can't feel the pulses in their feet, this is probably not your drug of choice. Okay. Well, I'm not going to talk very much about insulins. I'm just going to talk about some older insulins. So if you have questions about these insulins, other than NPH and regular, I'll be happy to answer them during the question and answer session. But today we're going to talk about the I can't afford it scenario. And believe me, the I can't afford it scenario comes up in my office a lot, and I'm sure in your office as well, because the insulin analogs that we're just discussing, the uh, ASPART, the uh, Basaglar now as generic Glargine or Lantus, a little less expensive, but many of these basal bolus insulins are incredibly expensive. My patients tell me their bill is about $300 for five pens in some insurance systems. I mean, isn't that incredible? If you took 100 units of insulin a day and there are 300 in a pen, whoa, <laughs> you'd be out, out a lot of money in your average three-month prescription. So a lot of my patients are beginning to shift back to the older, less expensive insulins like NPH and regular. I mean, if your patient has type 1 diabetes, your options are only NPH and regular in the morning, regular at dinner, and NPH at bedtime. That's the only scenario where you have 24-hour coverage. Remember, your type 1 diabetic needs 24-hour coverage. Type 2, some of them don't make very much insulin. Now, most of them make enough insulin so they don't go into DKA very often. They make enough insulin to get some glucose into the cells, but they may not make enough insulin to keep their blood sugar under 200 overnight. 
So in those patients with type 2, you're still going to have to use NPH and regular in the morning, regular at dinner, and NPH at bedtime to cover them for 24 hours. You say, well, how much? Well, the regular dose is, is the, the rapid-acting dose. They're the same unless you have the one or two patients on Earth who have A1Cs of less than 7.5. And, and in that case, you're going to decrease the rapid-acting, or the regular in this case, by 10%. The NPH is half the daily dose of basal, half in the morning, half at night. I can't afford it? Mm. Type 2 and 70-30. 70-30 is a combination of NPH and regular that is stable at 70% NPH and 30% regular, and you don't want to use that in the type 1 diabetic. It really doesn't give you 24-hour coverage well. Um, you can inch it around, but it's not going to be good. So you want to use that only in the type 2 who has some endogenous insulin production, frequently on metformin, makes a good combination with metformin. And remember, metformin's dirt cheap. So uh, again, some, some insurance companies are actually giving metformin away because it costs more to sell it to you than it actually is worth. So again, what you're going to do with 7030 is you're going to start a twice a day dose and you're going to uh, use it before breakfast and dinner. If the A1C is greater than nine, you start with three tenths of a unit per keg per day. Remember, insulin is a weight-based drug. So again, you can use that. Works very nicely. If that doesn't work and they're gonna require more insulin, you can't get the A1C to less than eight, then you're gonna switch to 0.2 units per keg per day before each meal. The NPH then lasts longer, stacks up, and covers you through the night. Occasionally, those people have to take NPH at bedtime by itself in order to get full nighttime coverage. Okay, so that's how you do it. And remember that NPH, regular, and 7030 are over-the-counter products. There's no prescription required. And if you want to make this as inexpensive as possible for your patient, what you're going to do is to type out the directions and the amount and the number of vials they're going to get, just as though you were giving them a prescription. But you just type that out, print it out, and hand it to them and tell them to take it to one of the chains that has generics. And the biggest chain that has the least expensive generic is Rely on Insulin by Walmart. And that costs now in our area $25 for 1,000 units of insulin. So that's the least expensive insulin you can buy. It works beautifully, and um, the patient doesn't need a prescription. They also don't need a prescription for the syringes. And I think I put that in your handout. The syringes are over the counter as well. But I also, I also tell them, remember these don't come in pens. I mean, that, so they, they have to learn how to use a syringe. The pharmacist will be happy to show them. But be sure you tell them to buy the syringe that fits. If they're taking 100 units of insulin, they're going to have to use the 100 unit syringe. The markings on it are only every two units. So you can't give them an odd numbered dose. You really can't. So just remember to pick the syringe that's going to fit and tell them these are disposable syringes. I have people say to me, could I just use this two or three times? Oh, can you imagine how dull the point of that syringe is going to be by the second time? No, 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 throw it out, OK? It's a disposable society. You, know, you turn in your car and throw it out. I mean, certainly you can turn in your syringe. OK, so now we get to the people who can't afford their strips. Oh, you know, those are a dollar a piece. Some of them are a dollar a piece. How am I going to afford my strips? Well, you can cut back a lot on the blood sugar testing that you do if you learn to count carbs. And then you just take the number of units of insulin, the number of grams of carbs. I can figure that out for you in the office. You teach people how to do that, and it cuts down on their checks of their blood sugar. By, you know, you can get by, if they're not pregnant, you get by with about one to two checks a day. So that cuts it back for a lot of patients, saves them money. And these apps really work. Some of them have pictures. So there's a picture of a pepperoni pizza, and it tells you how many carbs. So, so uh, they're excellent. Try that out. And so your patient checks before their evening meal, 
they count their carbs all the rest of the day, and then they use a correction factor or a scale before the evening meal, and that will get them down to an A1C of less than eight. So you can use that method if you like. Okay, how many people here have people on insulin pumps? I think that, I hate to say this, you're gonna hate this. All pregnant ladies <laughs> who have diabetes type one <laughs> should be on an insulin pump. I mean, really, the insulin pumps now are so good that these are the two most common kinds that are sold in the United States. And this one that says program to have normal glucose overnight, I won't mention the brand, actually has a sensor. And when you set the algorithm, if you are not eating, the pump regulates your sugar and it makes it perfect. Because the sensor tells it the sugar, the pump changes the insulin on an algorithm all by itself and overnight, the sugars are absolutely normal. The only time, the only thing you have to do is to put the carbohydrate count in to cover the meals. So this is a, uh, these new systems are called the artificial pancreas and they truly almost are. But I wanted to talk for a few minutes about something that's new that you might like to use in your office and that's continuous glucose monitors. And they're easily inserted in the office. They record the glucose of your patient for 14 days. They bring it back to the office and you download it. And it will tell you the patient's glucose 24 hours a day for those 14 days. Really helps you in certain kinds of patients. Uh, the finger stick doesn't match. You know, Mary Jo comes in with her beautiful diary. It looks like she did it on your, while waiting for you in the office. Or they're in her phone, uh -huh, right, putting them in the phone. And they're all normal. But the A1C is eight and a half. And, and you say, well, these are just points in time, Mary Jo. When do you think you had a high sugar? She says, well, I, I never see a high sugar. Okay, well, there you go. Uh, how about the patient on dialysis? The patient with anemia, the patient who's just had a transfusion, a rapid red cell turnover rates with hemolytic anemia. I had a guy come, I know it's a guy, I'm sorry, it's a women's health conference, but I had a, a guy come in on dialysis. He couldn't afford to do his sugars and his fasting sugar was the only one I had from the lab. Pre-dialysis was 217. He was on basal bolus insulin and nephrology sent him over and said, could I fix this? I said, well, um, hard to change the dose when I don't know the sugars. So you insert one of these, so easy. Even a physician can put one of these in. It's really very simple. You stick it, it's a subcutaneous sensor. You stick it on the patient and Medicare will pay for this once a year in all of your patients who have diabetes, type one or type two. And this is what it looks like. This is what his looked like. You say, whoa. This is a scattergram here. I need the pointer. So I would have thought sugar of 217 fasting. Boy, I ought to raise the basal insulin, right? Unless I looked at this sugar down here, woo, every night, he's about 50. So he's having hypoglycemia in the night. And then he's getting up and eating, which leads to a really high sugar around breakfast time when he's supposed to be fasting. Oh, and then over here, this is the average one here. He's doing okay at lunch. Uh-oh, what's that? I said, excuse me, uh, do you eat a really late dinner? He said, no, I eat cookies and ice cream for a snack every night. <laughs> You're supposed to have a diary with this thing. I said, you didn't write that down in your diary. He said, well, I didn't want you to know that. <laughs> okay. Well, so at any rate, just want to point out to you that this actually tells you what really is happening with the patient, and it stops you from making errors of raising the basal insulin, which most people do, when the patient has nocturnal hypoglycemia. So anyway, think about this for your office. Really easy to insert, really easy to download, and it works for your patients. Now, these are personal sensors. How many of you had people ask you for personal sensors? I wrote 10 prescriptions for personal sensors last week. They're gonna be wanting them. And it says up there, stop checking your blood sugars. Hey, you never have to stick your finger. These don't need calibration. They can sync to your phone. So what happens is you have a little device that you insert, sensor here, oh, there you go. 
And this is the Freestyle Libre, and this is the Dexcom G6. There's the sensor there. This one's about the size of a peanut. That one's about the size, I hesitate to say this, a 50 cent piece. Uh, you're gonna look out there, they're cover. I know you know how that size is, right? Not many of you left. Okay, so, <laughs> anytime done. So, at any rate, what you do is there's a sensor and there's a reader, and the reader is the large square box, and you put that right next to the sensor and it tells you what your blood sugar is, anytime, any place, anywhere. You can actually put it in your purse with the Dexcom, it can be about a couple of feet away. The Libra is about four or five inches away, and you can just know your blood sugar. So that's perfect. All of the pregnant folks I have are going to be wearing sensors. And so uh, helps you out. It's about $85 for the reader and about $25 a piece for the sensors and they last for about 10 days. You say, well, does anybody pay for those? You betcha. Medicare pays for diabetes patients who check four times a day and have three injections. So it really is gonna cut back on the number of checks that your patients who give themselves insulin before each meal have to make. Uh, it, it does say you can stop checking your sugars, but if you look down at the bottom here in the fine print, it says that if things aren't going right, you probably ought to check your sugar. <laughs> it doesn't seem like things are going well, you might wanna check. But these really work very nicely. Okay, as we end up here, I just want to tell you a couple of things about obesity. There are two balloons out there, two gastric balloons, and they, they're inserted with an endoscope and they blow up in your stomach and they hold, oh, both of them hold about 600 cc's of saline and then they stay in there and of course they make your stomach smaller. So people eat less. Mm -hmm. So on average they lose about 14 to 20 pounds over about six months with these. But what I want to tell you about them is that now they've been associated to a number of deaths because of both this one, which is the reshape, and the Obara intergastric balloon, which is a little different shape, have caused gastric artery erosion. They, they get out of the stomach. They erode through the stomach, particularly if you overeat around them, then they can erode into the gastric artery and it's too late. I mean, by the time 911 gets there, uh, you are unfortunately dead. So again, when people are asking about these, you might want to counsel them. They cost $8,000. They allow you to you lose about 14 to 22 pounds, and they can kill you. So in general, I don't recommend them. But you know, seriously, I mean, nobody knew this was going to happen, and this was just a big shock, and it's been one of the... Uh, real problems with obesity therapy this year as everyone wants to know about these. Okay, finally, what do um, fecal material and balloons have in common? <laughs> well, <laughs> no. Uh, what they're doing this year is fecal material from thin people being put into obese people and they're seeing if the microbiome in the thin people overrides the microbiome in the obese people and they're using a fecal material. So would you like to sign up for that? <laughs> With any luck, you'll be in the placebo group. Now this is from Mass General Hospital and it's, it's ongoing. They haven't had any results yet, but unfortunately you can't get in because they finished enrollment. Okay, so do you wanna wait for the end for questions for both of us? You want question? Okay. Okay. I've forgotten what we did yesterday. It must be Alzheimer's. Yeah, we're right here. Yeah. Hello, thank you for your informative talk. I had a question. Um, you were saying the second line of therapy for the type 2 diabetes were the, um, the GLP-1 receptor agonists, and you said Victoza, but what about the extended release ones like Bidurian? Oh, they're all, um, the, two, the two weekly ones, actually Trulicity, uh, Lexanotide, and um, Semaglutide all have cardiovascular data that's favorable, and they are weekly. So it's not only just the Liraglutide, which is daily, but so the, the weekly, weekly ones have cardio, the, some of the weekly ones have cardiovascular data as well. So yes, they're all second line, whether okay. they're, and, and most people like weekly, but a, a good point that Bidurion is actually the one that many insurance companies favor because it's the cheapest one. <laughs> so. I have two questions. 
One is the postpartum A1C. If you did it at the six week checkup, it would incorporate the end of pregnancy, which is a high insulin resistant state. So wouldn't that possibly falsely diagnose people with long-term diabetes who were just still insulin resistant from pregnancy? You have a wide window there in terms of the A1C. So what you're looking at is somebody who's over 6.5. Okay. That would be really so unusual. So not just the sixes. And, right. And this, right. this article is very nice. It has actual data. It's not prospective randomizer control, but it's retrospective data. And the A1C actually parallels the uh, to our oral glucose tolerance test very nicely, mm -hmm. even at six weeks. Better at 12 weeks, okay. but halfway okay. decent at six weeks. Okay. And then the other one, the new ACOG guidelines are now, instead of doing gliburide, which we've done forever for gestational diabetics, is now insulin first line and metformin second line. Yes. Um, so for those of us like myself who've never really prescribed insulin, um, this has been hard. So I was wondering what just a, like, basic guideline would be starting somebody on insulin for gestational diabetes. Ah, you're, uh, well, you know, that's controversial, so I'm going to have it you weigh is. in, but <laughs> most people are using NPH and regular still, and that same format I gave okay. you, and you can start, uh, it depends, type 1 you're going to start with about 0.25 to 0.5 units per keg per day, mm -hmm. and you're going to d base your end of the scale on that on whether or not they have complications. If you have nephropathy, I want you on the 0.25. Our type 1s go to endocrinologists. We don't even touch those. So I'm talking about just gestational diabetics. Oh, the, okay. the, new, the new recommendations are for gestational diabetes to start them on insulin. Oh, yes. Well, you could still use NPH okay. and regular. And you, I think you could use that same format with okay. gestational. Probably I go more like uh, 0.3 to 0.5 units per keg per day for the whole dose, and then you're going to divide that half and half between basal okay. and bolus. Um, I don't know if you guys use 7030. I don't particularly because particularly I don't get good coverage for 24 hours. And Did some people are using uh, Glargine because it doesn't cross the placenta. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the people I see coming in, uh, the OB people start folks on insulin. If they have problems, sometimes they send them over to us. But mm -hmm. um, the, the people I'm seeing now are starting them on um, Glargine. And it uh, is not approved, mm -hmm. but uh, the rapid actings, uh, Aspart, uh, which is Novolog, and uh, the Lyspro, which is Humalog, are both approved for pregnancy, and they are just uh, basal bolus insulin. You figure out basal okay. bolus just the way mm -hmm. I calculated okay. it for you. Type 2 is 0.5 to 1 units per keg per day, and type 1 is 0.25 to 5. And that's, I use that in gestational diabetes as well. Okay. Yeah, you can. Maybe Dr. Balika, yeah. can you answer this one? <laughs> Actually, I'll go back to the, to the basics. You know, um, we use regular and use MPH, and I think you know the way you do it, you do it the traditional way. It's very interesting. Where you, you give glyburide all the time for 10 years, now is the bad drug. Yeah. We bring in metformin in, and going to have a couple of slides about that. Oh, yeah. um, there, uh, you know, ACOG came in February in 2018 to just give them uh, insulin to the preferential treatment or first line treatment. So the way is 0 0.7 to 1, depends on the uh, what uh, what trimester they are. And generally speaking, for me not to make them hypoglycemic, I give just two thirds of the calculated dose. So that kind so of gives me, so give me two or three, four days to figure out where we are. We just bring them back to give us, a, uh, to call us with the numbers and then just gradually, uh, gradually increase. I mean, obviously they do four times uh, a day. The finger sticks depend what cutoffs. We use two hours rather than to use one hour. I, I think people, by the time they finish eating and doing other things, it's just almost impossible to, to measure one hour. Two hours is pretty good and we use the cutoff at 120. But I think we're going to go going back to the traditional regular MPH. We use that all the time, comes and goes. We don't have too much experience in our practice using uh, actually the, the fast acting ones. Sure. I think it's, uh, it's, even though it's approved and it's it just do not use it. I think, you know, during the meal, even though it's more convenient, you don't have to give it, you know, before the meals and follow up a little bit longer. But we see reasonable experience that we have. It's almost like a, this, uh, mid-career people that we've studied with this, now went through cell phone arrears, and now we're debating between. Even though it's gonna be some push from, I think, from MFM, because they like metformin, 
they just really like it for other, you know, preeclampsia complication, reduce other obstetrical outcomes. So I think that's going to be a, a little bit of a fine. In the regular use, I mean, they give us a little bit of disclaimers. One of the disclaimers is that uh, if the patient cannot take it, it's very simple not to take shots, you know, and you can use metformin. Um, and um, obviously, if you do be an affordable, I think it's so cheap that probably, you know, between those two, so I don't think it's the issue of, uh, of for, you know, they give you if you cannot afford it. But the issue is can this patient actually does the injection the way it is? And they'll say, well, you just make sure a document and start with metformin. Usually start at night with 500, then we increase, uh, increase and uh, we discussed the, the, the difference with the sulfonylurea is doesn't cross the placenta. This one does, and what does it mean long term? That's something that you have to discuss with, uh, with, uh, with the patient. Um, I think this is, you know, traditional, go traditional, you know, the, all these new regular and MPH. So you don't use rapid acting, which is really no. so bad. Yes. <laughs> My yes. patients really love that. Anyway, uh, so, um, so are you using sensors? You know, that's what oh, all my no. patients are going to be using, sensors. No, no. I, I think we have, well, listen, the pre-gestational diabetes usually manage, you know, to, to get or with even MFM tonight. I mean, the pumps and sensors and everything else, you know, just going to go to endocrine. Um, I think we, we have to have also a practical approach to this, you know, if you have a large diabetic population for a short period of time that comes through your, you just have to be everybody to be in tune to practice the same. Um, if you're like a larger group of seven, eight people, we cannot just play with sensors. The other, I don't know, the pump. I don't know how to use it. Actually, I thought the pump is mostly endocrine. If they use it, I think that's going to be their pregestational pump. It's all endocrine, not even MFM. I think uh, they touch it. <coughs> Sorry. Right here. Yeah, one more. Um, are you having much success with the uh, newer long-lasting agents like Traceba and Tegeo? And if so, how much are you having to increase the dose by? Okay, I think Traceba, uh, or Degladec is Traceba, and it is a really great drug for, it's peakless, absolutely peakless for at least 24 hours, and some t patients that last for 42. So the patient who needs a really low dose of insulin and just has to have it last for 24 hours. The frail patient, the elderly patient, the malnutrition patient, the, the young child, that population is perfect. You can use it in other folks, I mean, obviously, but it's not any better than the others. And the um, Tujeo, which is U300 Glargine, is probably overused and it has no advantages except volume. So where are you going to use that as the person who is injecting a couple of hundred units of glargine? They can't get it in, hard to put in, and it leaks out. They're having injection problems. Then this works. But the only difference is the volume is a third less. So it's, it's a third of the volumes of the, of the uh, glargine. So that's about its only niche. It doesn't change your world into another color. You've seen that commercial where the lady's walking around a white world, she takes <laughs> Tujeo, and now it becomes colored. It doesn't work. But really, Tujeo is you know, a, a nice marketing ploy, and it doesn't decrease the risk of nocturnal hypoglycemia. There's just a nice review article about that in the annals last week. So we've got to get Dr. DePetty up here. Have we got any more? We're, we're going to be around, so. Okay. Everybody else is so generous to us. That's, they always are. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, can you hear me? Back in there. Good. Hi, everyone. This week. How about there? Great. Thank you, Randy. Dr. Pisiak, thank you so much for that lecture. Because for the last 20 years, I have ignored all the new insulins. I didn't bother to know them, the names, the whatevers, the durations, et cetera. And what goes around comes around. I know NPH and regular. <laughs> that was just, that was music to my ears. I can't wait to go back to our clinics and tell the, tell the house staff this that I've made it. 
In addition, this is just a sister uh, risk factor regarding diabetes, obesity, and of course hypercholesterolemia, as uh, Dr. Pisiak already said, with metabolic syndrome. Uh, I'm going to review the guidelines, or at least the more recent guidelines, on hypercholesterolemia. And uh, even though I'm a hypertension uh, uh, specialist, if, if you will, I'm very proud of, of the hypertension group uh, and my colleagues because really basically what, what has been happening in cholesterol has been mirroring the hypertension group. Uh, the hypertension group, of course, started the, the National Hypertension Detection Follow-up Program and the National Education Program, which was modeled then by our lipid uh, and hypercholesterolemic and endocrinology uh, colleagues. So what, you're going to see very, very close parallels to this, uh, this uh, lecture and, and also the hypertension guideline lecture that we're going to have uh, on Thursday. Uh, what's also interesting is they're having the same problems. Uh, again, it's what goes around comes around. Uh, there's been waxes and wanes regarding the guidelines, and there's, it's not different between the hypercholesterolemic guidelines and the hypertension guidelines. Uh, we've gone forward, we've regressed, we've moved forward again, and it's an ebb and tide, and it's very, very interesting how closely they parallel. The only financial disclosures I have is I do serve uh, as a formal advisor to the World Health Organization and uh, the Centers for Disease Control. But this capacity is in hypertension as well, but it's only as a consultant advisor. The learning objectives, of course, is to review recent clinical trials regarding intensive lowering of LDL cholesterol. This is really basically what's new. Review the U.S. guidelines on the treatment of hypercholesterolemia, and then discuss how in the world are we going to put these new guidelines and where do we put these new guidelines, particularly with the cost implications of some of the new uh, therapeutic agents in some perspective. And all I can do is offer an opinion because we're suffering as all of, uh, all of you are. Uh, suffering regarding cost of all new drugs, including the biologics, for instance, for all types of other diseases. Before we move forward, it's also important, I think, and we're going to discuss this with hypertension as well, to look backwards and where, you know, where have we been? Yeah. Where are we now? And then ultimately, of course, where do we think we're going? If we even know, and that's a really, really a dilemma, as you're going to see. Well, where have we been? I came through uh, my training and then my junior faculty and, and midlife uh, faculty status and physician status, uh, really believing in the, lip, the LDL or lipid hypothesis. And the LDL hypothesis was, is that the lower the LDL, the better. And that guidelines, just like blood pressure, the lower the blood pressure, the better. And that guidelines, therapies, et cetera, therapeutic agents should be really guided by how well they lower the blood pressure, in this case, how well they lower the LDL cholesterol. And for the vast majority of my career, that's been the basis of the guidelines for hypercholesterolemia. As you can see by the ATP3 guidelines, they were LDL-based. They, they also layered on cardiovascular risk, which then determined the threshold and then determined the target LDL cholesterol. And that seemed all well and good. And as you can Mem you remember most of these. I do not have to go through them uh, for you. But, but you know, virtue, if you were low risk, you would start at 160 or greater, and you'd lower less than 160 uh, LDL cholesterol or greater. And same thing with similar as we're going to discuss with blood pressure. Well, what happened along the way to this wonderful and, and evidence-based hypothesis? Well, in 2013, as you all know, the ACC and AHA Guidelines Committee really turned everything on its head, and quite appropriately at the time, and we'll discuss why they did so. Rather than the LDL, following the LDL hypothesis that using the LDL as a treatment initiation or treatment target, they looked at the evidence. And just like the JNC8 Hypertension Committee, they were largely told be evidence-based driven and it was drummed into them, into the guidelines committee, and it was drummed into the guidelines committee to ask very few questions, but answer those questions according to evidence base. And the ACC AHA uh, cholesterol uh, guideline committee did the exact same thing on the exact same temporal time, if you will, as the JNC8 uh, committee did for hypertension. And reviewing the evidence turned everything upside down. Rather than following the LDL hypothesis and using the LDL as the primary guide, they looked at the, the evidence and they looked at the literature. 
And quite frankly, there were no studies based on the LDL hypothesis. In other words, starting at such a level, lowering it to such a level, titrating that level, showing that lower is better. And in fact, there was only evidence-based medicine that determined the statin intensity, which indirectly determined how much the LDL would be lowered, but largely was not a tar the LDL was not the target. It was the intensity of the statin therapy that was administered, which formed the basis of the evidence-based uh, medicine that the guidelines committee reviewed. Given that, they went completely the other way, and again, appropriately for their charge, and determined that it's the patient group, it's the patient in front of you in your practice that should determine whether you treat LDL cholesterol or cholesterol and to what, uh, what intensity you treat. And of course, we all know this, and this is, the, by the way, this recommendation still holds, and it's still the, the foundation of our therapy of the individual in our practice come Monday morning, uh, unless you're going to go to the, the office on the weekends, and you may, uh, in terms of the basis of our therapy. So this has not changed, but as you're going to see, there's been additions, and now there's a hybrid model that we're going to come to some uh, congruence with. And again, the committee recommended four specific treatment groups. You know them all. I do not have to review them here today. And what they recommended was not an LDL goal, if you remember, but the intensity of the statin moderate intensity statin versus high intensity statin. And basically, that was indirectly related to LDL reduction because they said a moderate re a statin, a dosage of a statin should achieve greater than 30% reduction of your LDL. But a high intensity statin should, could, should uh, concur a greater than 50% reduction in your LDL from baseline. But, not a tar but it was not a target. It was the intensity, not the goal target. However, they did have, if snuck in there, uh, some what ifs. And the what ifs were, well, what if, you, if that moderate intensity, that your target was less than 30, uh, was, great, was, less than, was greater than 30% reduction, what if you didn't achieve it? What if your high intensity statin that you were, gonna, that you were using did not achieve a greater than 50% reduction in LDL? Or what if the patient had differing risks, in your opinion, and in that individual practitioner uh, patient discussion in the office, and they did say that you could consider non-statin therapies for certain considerations, but it was very vague. Again, it was not directed at LDL cholesterol reduction levels, uh, and as you can see, they recommended using non-statin cholesterol-lowering drugs that had randomized controlled trials. Totally appropriate recommendations for 2013. What happened between 2013 now and 2018? The very same thing that happened to the hypertension world. There was new evidence-based medicine. And in the cholesterol world, that new evidence-based medicine started, although there were others, really basically started with this study, the Improve It study, which you all know, which used a, a, a cholesterol-absorbing agent. I can never say this agent, despite thousands of times trying it. I think it's a Zetamibi. Dr. Pizek, is that close? Yeah, Zetamibi, whatever you want to call it. I don't see any mide in there, but OK. Uh, in terms of decreasing cholesterol absorption. Sort of the not, a newer cholestyramine, not a bile acid sequestrant, but a direct cholest uh, cholesterol-binding agent in the gut. And the approve -it trial asked one simple question. If you add a, a, a second mechanism to lower cholesterol or LDL cholesterol to a statin, in this case, simvastatin, what would, what would you do to the LDL cholesterol and what would you do to cardiovascular outcomes? And the design was very simple and straightforward. Patients were stabilized post-acute coronary syndrome. So no, no, note that these are high-risk cardiovascular patients. They've already demonstrated their risk. You don't have to guess uh, this patient population. But more importantly for the hypothesis, they randomized these individuals to two different groups, the statin and statin plus, further reduction in LDL cholesterol, in this case with uh, GI cholesterol binding. And they followed them for about two or three years on average. Well, what happened? What happened was that the cardiovascular outcomes were significantly reduced with adding a second drug to our standard uh, statin-based therapy, as you can see here. The dual therapy all goes to this side, which in 
which means that there was marked reduction in cardiovascular outcomes with further lowering of LDL cholesterol with dual treatment versus statin treatment alone. And notice this was reported in 2014, which was after the 2013 ACC AHA guidelines. This was not available to be reviewed for those guidelines. And the conclusions was that further lipid lowering or LDL lipid lowering uh, significantly reduced major cardiovascular endpoints, the total primary endpoint, as well as secondary uh, cardiac cardiovascular endpoints with further LDL reduction. And that was news. And that, this study supports the LDL hypothesis, which is lowering the LDL cholesterol is better, but however, this is only, this is one avenue to lower it. Perhaps it's drug specific as opposed to LDL cholesterol specific. That still remained a question. Well, the real breaking news, as you all know, which is breaking the bank, as well as breaking the news, is this class of, of medications, the PCSK9 uh, inhibitors, if you will. And how do these agents work? Well, first of all, we know a lot about the elder receptor, thanks to our no Nobel laureates from this country, Brown, Brown and Goldstein, and thanks to our patients with familial uh, homozygous and heterozygous uh, hypercholesterolemia which is obviously an LDL receptor deficiency and complete absence uh, in those unfortunate. We know that the LDL receptor cycles. It's obviously, it's, it's, effic its efficacy comes from its bringing from the, from the internal, the intracellular uh, domain to the extracellular domain where the receptor can bind to LDL cholesterol. And then LDL is internalized. The LDL is used, stored, or repackaged and excreted. But importantly, the cell is highly efficient. This is probably a hepatocyte. It's best demonstrated as a hepatocyte. And the LDL receptor is actually recycled. The cell is very, very is energy saving and it's, uh, it's obviously very efficient. And that's what we want to happen. There is, however, this other component, PS, uh, PCSK9, which when it binds to the LDL receptor, the opposite happens. When the receptor is normally internalized, however, when it's bound to this compound, it, is, it goes right to endosomes and lysosomes, and the LDL receptor is now degraded. And both things are happening simultaneously at the, at the cell site. Some are being, and there's homeostasis in most, in, you know, in most normal individuals. This is okay. This is actually a, a yin-yang effect uh, and is obviously, a, has an advantage. Um, and there's a homeostasis of the LDL, LDL receptor. However, when there's an abnormality of LDL receptor function or quantity and or in generation, if you inhibit this protein, if you inhibit PCSK9 and you block its binding to the LDL, LDL receptor, everything shifts obviously to this pathway, which is LDL receptor conserving. And we know that the more LDL receptors you have in the cell, cell surface, say, is in a, in a hepatocyte, the lower your LDL is going to be because there's more LDL receptors to internalize the LDL and have it go somewhere else as opposed to in the serum and into other nonspecific tissues like the heart blood vessels, which would be bad. Well, that would all just be nice basic science and physiology like my, like my medical students at USC tell me, what do I need to know this for, right? Well, you need to know this because you have to wait 20 years to find out the answer. Well, you know, this generation wants it now, right? Well, I did too. In any event, now we do have P PS, uh, PCSK9 inhibitors, as you know. And this has really, really revolutionized not only the treatment of, of hypercholesterolemia, but the way we approach hypercholesterolemia and it has renewed the LDL hypothesis, if you will. They're FDA approved for patients that have inadequately treated LDL cholesterol levels. I will give you some specifics, particularly with the first agent that was, that was approved, what, the, what it's approved for. These are monoclonal antibodies, so it's not a manufactured drug. These antibodies obviously have to be produced. They're very, very costly, and they cost a lot. And that's the second problem. Uh, but it's our problem as, as providers and as a society, as opposed to not a problem with science. The science is here. And of course, the very, very first one 
was ivalocumab. And it's indicated for familial hypercholesterolemia. I've already alluded to that. Individuals that have extraordinarily high, greater than 190 uh, milligrams per deciliter of LDL, that's the heterozygotes. And of course, we know, our pediatric colleagues know better than I, the homozygote uh, individuals with familial uh, hypercholesterolemia obviously have serum cholesterols of 1,000, 1,200, and have very, very premature uh, cardiovascular disease, of course. These are antibodies, as I've seen. And now we actually have evidence-based medicine in major clinical trials with not just one agent, but two of these agents to further uh, solidify uh, the evidence-based medicine so that we can incorporate them into new guidelines if, if we want to. And the real big new, trouble, new, new study was the four-year uh, trial, as you, say, as you show here. It was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial that investigated the effects of using one of these agents, uh, in addition to high-intensity statin, very similar to the IMPROVE-IT study in terms of the design. It was additive onto high-intensity statin therapy uh, in individuals that have clini had well, clinical high risk, and to see whether uh, baseline uh, LDL cholesterols of greater than 70, if you lowered them further, would there be any clinical benefit, i.e., examining the, lipid, the, the LDL lipid hypothesis that lower perhaps could, could be better? Or is it doesn't matter, is there a threshold? There was a jillion people in this study. There was almost 30,000 people. And the baseline LDL cholesterol was approximately 100 in both groups. That's where they started. Well, this is dramatic. If you told me in my lifetime, as a practicing physician and academician, if you will, that I'd ever be able to lower LDL cholesterol where I want to lower LDL cholesterol to 30 milligrams per deciliter. These do it. Look at the dramatic, this was placebo, so they started at 92-ish, and they stayed there throughout the study period. But look what, look what intervening and blocking the, the, CS, uh, C, the PCSK9 uh, protein does. It dramatically lowers the LDL cholesterol to levels of 30, and they're, then they're sustainable. There's no regression, there's no tolerance, there's no tachyphylaxis. Wow. What happened? I would have thought the person would have just turned into a bowl of jelly and mush, because that's what I was told, because you need cholesterol in your membranes, your cell membranes, et cetera, and we're just gonna fall apart if we lowered LDL cholesterol to these levels. Well, what happened was, there was further reduction, just like in the IMPROVE-IT trial, although probably even more uh, power, more significant in terms of reductions in major cardiovascular event rates. As you can, you don't need to even read them, you could just see the lines. Here's the, there's statin alone, and here's dual therapy, statin alone, and dual therapy. There was a significant reduction in cardiovascular primary and secondary endpoints with now this further and actually really significant reduction in LDL cholesterol. And that's the new news. Now the question is, what do you do with this news? So the results were that the, age, that the agent of alocumab decreased LDL cholesterol levels to 30 compared to the placebo, which stayed at baseline, approximately 92. Primary, primary outcome was significantly reduced. Secondary outcome, significantly reduced. I would have thought there might have been some side of, you know, unfavorable side effect profiles, et cetera. There was none other than injection site, you know, local reactions, et cetera, since it is subcutaneously administered. But the concern is that, number one, if you look at the absolute reduction in cardiovascular risk, you have to, and I, I caution you when you look at the literature, you're going to see the, the relative reduction, which is placebo compared to uh, the intervention, in this case, it's 25% reduction. But if you look at the absolute reduction, it was 1.5%, which is a much smaller number, yet still significant. And of course, the cost is $14,000 per year. I'll let you guys decide. Yeah. <laughs> Who am I, right? I was a former dean, I never want to do that again. Well, that was with one of the agents. Well, what if it was just one agent? Maybe it's not the class at all. It just happened to be that agent. This is really hot off the presses. Uh, this is only an abstract form. It was, it was presented at the American College of Cardiology uh, national meeting just a month or so uh, ago, so I, grabbed, I got the data. 
new trial, the Odyssey trial. This is very similar, however, it uses a different PCSK9 inhibitor, but same, same mechanism of action, so that's new. They enrolled patients within one year of an acute coronary event, so again, very high-risk individuals, patients already demonstrating they, they're fully capable of having a coronary event. Uh, and they had to have an LDL cholesterol of greater than 70. The baseline average was 87. Remember, in the four-year trial, it was 92, so pretty, pretty similar. You could increase the dose, if needed, to reach a target LDL of 25 to 50, and that was based on the four-year goal of 30 milligrams per deciliter. And you could discontinue, and this is interesting, if the LDL went down to less than 15 milligrams per deciliter as a safety precaution, but believe it or not, we don't believe there's any difference uh, at very, very low LDL cholesterols. I was just at another uh, meeting and I was asked, uh, some labs are reporting non-detectable LDL cholesterols on these agents now. It's below the accuracy of their, they can, they can give you a number, but they don't feel confident in giving you a number, so now they just say non-detectable. I mean, my goodness. Hope it's detectable in the brain. <laughs> okay, what happened? Of course, I wouldn't be up here if it wasn't positive. The Odyssey trial, again, showed highly significant reduction in major adverse coronary events of all likings, with the exception of coronary heart disease, everything else was significantly reduced. And remember, this was a short-term uh, uh, study, so you may not see a difference in death. Maybe if it was longer term, we, we would. But these are only one to two, two and a half year studies, because the, 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 events, the, the, the events and the results are so dramatic. However, they did look at subpopulations in the Odyssey trial, and they looked at individuals. Remember, the mean baseline was 87. That means about half of the patients had LDL cholesterols greater than 100, and half had, you know, thereabouts. Don't spot me the mathematics, but thereabouts half of them had less than 100 because that's the mean, 87. They did look, though, at stratification of baseline LDL uh, cholesterols, and they, did, they noticed very strikingly that it was the patients that had a baseline LDL cholesterol of greater than 100 that derived the most benefit. Now remember, they were all on high-intensity statins, and some of them were actually even on statins plus uh, GI cholesterol binding, as well we just saw in the, in the Improve It study. And if you, if you subdivide it into this category, the reduction in major cardiovascular event rates were much greater and the intention to treat, the, the needed to treat, to derive benefit was only 29, which is striking. But still remember the price tag, you know, 14,000-ish dollars for, this, for the price of, of this. And here's the graphs. I apologize for the quality because I actually really did take it from the, <laughs> from the slide. It's not been published yet, but it'll be published soon. Uh, these, are the baseline, these are the baseline LDLs, as you can see. I think I can't, read, I can't actually even read that. But here's the greater than 100. And you can see that the lowest uh, tertile, no real significant difference in events uh, reduction. Again, the middle tertile, and it's really the greater than 100 milligram per deciliter tertile that, res that resolved, that demonstrated most, the, most, if not all, of the benefit from the entire trial, which might help us direct you know, clinical guidelines if needed in the future. This is just really hot off the presses. This is, study has not been reviewed by any guidelines committee at all, but it might help us. At least at $14,000 a shot, you know, a person per year, maybe it might give us some guidelines. So I did want to bring it to you even if it's premature, although it will be, it will be published, probably in the American College of Cardiology. So how would, with this new evidence-based medicine, what's changed in the guidelines? And we'll discuss the exact same thing in hypertension in a few days with new evidence-based medicine, how does it impact guidelines, and then ultimately our clinical practice. This is what there's, as Dr. Pesiak said, there's ADA guidelines, there's uh, the Association of the Clinical Endocrinologists and College of Endocrinology guidelines. I brought you these because they're the most comprehensive that I could find right now, and, and they're as new as the ADA guidelines, but I'm going to tell you both. But the ADA guidelines just are as supportive of what we're going to discuss, since these fit our, our uh, symposium and our week a little bit better, and you'll see why. As with previous guidelines, they've always, all guidelines have had some determinant of cardiovascular risk. 
even in the ACC AHA guidelines, those four populations they chose were high risk cardiovascular populations. So indirectly, they were using risk. And remember, they also used the risk calculator within those populations to determine moderate versus intensive statin therapy. So we're very comfortable using cardiovascular risk in our clinical guideline paradigm, if you will. And they kept the major four cardiovascular risk groups similar to the past. Not really much difference from low risk to very high risk. But the, what's different, I'm only going to tell you for sake of time what's new, is that they added this category. And look how big this category is, because they had to explain it. You know, if you, have, if you use a lot of words to explain something, there's a problem, right? Like, like I tell everybody on the, all of my students, if, the, if, if it's a multiple choice question, it's the longest answer always. Here's the new category, extreme risk. So what's extreme risk? I don't want to read it for you, but it's really patients with significant cardiovascular disease, either proven cardiovascular disease or well on their way to cardiovascular disease, as you can see here. This category is added based on, and they even give a disclaimer, why this new category. They felt they had to even justify this new category and notice that they, they used the Improve It study which, I, which we just reviewed as the basis for this new extreme cardiovascular risk category. That's really basically what's new. This is a female population. They spend a lot of time, and I, and I don't want to review the whole thing, the recommendations for you, but congratulations to the Guidelines Committee and kudos to the Guidelines Committee. They spent a significant amount of time on gender differences, particularly the differences in our female population. A few years ago, we gave a lecture on cardiovascular disease in women, and they paralleled that lecture. And basically, what they're basically saying, I'll summarize it for you, is women are important. Well, I knew that. <laughs> so tell me something different. Well, they present differently. Their physiology is different. The pregnancy intervenes, et cetera. Uh, and they acknowledge these. Uh, but basically, what they're saying is treat women the same in terms of guidelines, in terms of uh, treatment thresholds and goals, but pay attention to significant differences, particularly in HDL cholesterol, particularly in women that have low HDL cholesterols. Uh, they may be more at risk than men, because uh, they're supposed to, obviously females are supposed to have higher HDL cholesterols than us guys, and that's down in, that's down in here. You all have these slides for you. <coughs> Well, yes, this should have been yesterday, but it's pretty close. It's only a day, uh, a day later, still within the, the box. They also gave special attention to children and adolescents, and this is relatively new, and this is the epidemic. This is the obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome uh, epidemic that's now, uh, in, that's now afflicting our, our adolescents and well into early childhood, as early as three, four, five, ten year, you know, ten-year-old uh, uh, kids running around in our communities, neighborhoods, and some of our practices, thank you, Lord, not mine. Uh, but I do still get questions. And here's where the familial uh, 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 hypercholesterolemic syndrome comes in play. When you should you start screening uh, children for cholesterol? And this is interesting. I found this in the bottom line somewhere. It's three years old of age that we should start tr screening cholesterol in high-risk children. I, I was not aware of that, quite frankly, because this is obviously it's not my practice. And then again, in non-high non risk, it's still 9 to 11, you should start with a, your first cholesterol. So I wanted to bring that to your attention because, again, that was our, our we committed yesterday to this uh, patient population. And this uh, was interesting. They had to make, they, they actually really tried to re- uh, explore why the LDL hypothesis, why the LDL hypothesis should not only be revisited, but in play they used these meta-analyses which showed that the lower your LDL cholesterol in major statin lipid lowering trials, the, the less your cardiovascular disease rates. So the lipid hypothesis by this meta-analysis is alive and well. It's not an intensity of the statin, although the, J, the 2013 committee looked at the evidence, and that's the evidence they had. We have more evidence now. We have these extremely low LDL cholesterols to add into our analyses. We didn't have those extremely low LDL cholesterols because no agent would get to, the, to those levels. So this, is, this part is all new. And when you put this part into new, which is into the old, you can see now 
that even down to 50, 30 to 50 LDL cholesterols, there's a further reduction in cardiovascular endpoints. So what does this do to us? What's the implications, then, of the new evidence-based medicine, uh, the, the new guidelines, et cetera, and this new extreme risk category? Take this home uh, with you because it's a very, I think it's relatively simple. All you need to do is look at this column, the LDL cholesterol. They did put in non-HDL cholesterol, and they put in ApoB levels, but clinically, really, this is where we're at. This is what we're measuring in our practices. And as you can see, low risk, you treat greater than 130, and to less than 130 LDL cholesterol. What does that remind you of? ATP3, pretty close. I mean, it was 160, but nevertheless, eh, I'll spot them that. You go down to 100 if you're moderate or high risk. The target if you're very high risk, that class 4 risk, is less than 70. The ADA would certainly agree with that. And really, this is the only thing that I saw that was actually new, is the extreme high risk was there for a reason. They're actually saying your LDL cholesterol threshold treatment goal should be less than 55. And that's new, best I, can, the best I know, that they're giving an LDL target as opposed to just use these drugs. So what are we going to do? And what's the, what's the summary? The LDL percent reduction is not met for following statin benefit. In other words, if you did not achieve the benefit, that 30% or 50% reduction, or the benefit in those risk categories, the, the, the new targets, if you will, although most of them are old, then yes, consider adding second agent, uh, one or the other, or even both together. And as you can see, these are the four general risk groups, if you will. Clinical uh, disease, uh, cardiovascular disease with comorbidities, absolutely. The new recommendations are either or or both. What about the patients with familial, for the most part, familial heterozygotes for hypercholesterolemia? Same thing. What about diabetics? And again, the, uh, the ADA would, as Dr. Uh, Pizek just showed you, would say less than 70. That new high risk group would say less than 55 if you want to incorporate that into you, that guideline into your practice. Again, both. And what if you're just, a, if you're moderate, et cetera, uh, or high cardiovascular risk, greater than seven and a half, consider adding a second drug to the statin therapy if obviously you've not met your, your preordained statin therapy goals with either the moderate or the high intensity. And this would presumably be a high intensity statin already at this point in that treatment paradigm. So let's conclude. LDL reduction now becomes a major factor in the primary prevention of, sec of primary and secondary cardiovascular disease. This is a step backwards, if you will, from the ACC 2013 guidelines, which moved away from LDL as the target and intensity of the drug as the target We've now moved back to putting the LDL cholesterol level more in the forefront, forefront of our foundation of therapy. Statins, including intensity and cardiovascular risk, continue to still be the mainstay of our treatment. I don't think we should, we should sway, at this point in time, too far uh, from that foundation. That's the foundation of our therapy. And now we should, maybe we can just prune the leaves around the, uh, the trunk somewhat with the new evidence based when we can afford it. LDL reduction below 70 and now 55 in certain groups is indicated. And now we're in a new era of cholesterol management in the appropriate patient, of, in the appropriate patient and patient subgroups, again, with cost considerations. But again, that's not a science issue. That's going to be a societal, our, our issue. And I think the bottom line conclusion is we may change it tomorrow or next year if we're all welcome back here again in Kiowa, and I hope we will be, uh, the LDL hypothesis is now alive and well again. So thank you very, very much for having me this afternoon. I look forward to any questions and or uh, further interactions we're going to have throughout the week. Questions? <clears throat> It's so dramatic, I know, we're just, we're, we're speechless. <laughs> Ronnie. 
Okay, so if, if you noticed in your slides, which you bet you did, they have now trashed the risk calculator from the American Heart Association, the ACC. Yes. And they, they're saying framing him and Reynolds. Yes. So what are we going to use here? What would be your thoughts of yeah. calculating the risk? Uh, ADA doesn't calculate right. risk, but how about people yep. without diabetes? I still think the risk calculator is important. Uh, what Dr. Pisiak is, is saying is even when the initial guidelines in 2013 were published with the risk calculator, it was a new risk calculator. The ACC and AHA committee actually used a new risk calculator that was developed internally between you know, experts within those two groups and as well as others to determine cardiovascular risk. And the reason for that is they did some good. They put, that, they put ethnicity into the, into the category. They put African American, they put Caucasian, et cetera, in, which, is not, which is not in other uh, cardiovascular risk calculations. So in, in certain respects, it was a really giant leap forward, and it was an, an acknowledgment that we're not all the same. On the other hand, it was, highly, it was highly criticized and controversial because on the younger population and the older population, it overestimated the cardiac risk. So if you were in the middle, then you were okay. It was pretty accurate. But if you were, I don't remember the age, but if you were, uh, by the way, the definition of elderly to Don DePetty gets one day longer for every day I live. <laughs> so in any event, let's say you were 60, 60, 65 years of age, almost everybody would have gotten a statin based on the estimate of cardiovascular risk on age alone, independent of everything else, smoking, blood pressure, race diabetes, et cetera. If you were young, it did the exact same thing. So Ronnie, that was, the, that was the controversy. There was just a paper out this year that that risk calculator was redone. Uh, and those abnormalities are reported to be uh, resolved and or improved. I don't know, I'm not, it's not my, I don't, I'm not an expert on, on the statistics that go into developing risk calculators. I still think it, it's going to be used, it can be used. It'll probably be modified, if not already in our apps, we'll have to get, download some modifications. If you want to use the Framingham Heart Study Risk Calculator, that's tried and true. It does not take into account, account other significant uh, demographics that might change the calculation of risk, but fair enough. In our global uh, hypertension initiative that again we've been talking about and we'll continue to talk about, Ronnie, you'll be pleased that we use the Framingham uh, Heart Risk uh, Calculator because we just did not want to get into that controversy knowing full well, though, that uh, we may be changing the calculator or changing that you know, down, but that's presently what we decided for on the global basis, just so we could kind of like just get out of that business because the control rates of diabetes, hypertension, obesity, smoking are so abysmal, let's just start someplace. <laughs>